Member statements. I recognize the member for Toronto St. Paul's. Good morning, Speaker. I stand honoured today in solidarity with the tenants of 440 Winona Drive in our fabulous riding of St. Paul's. Their seniors, young people, people with disabilities, physical and mental health challenges, they're racialized, working class on fixed income. They speak many languages. They're immigrants, LGBT, and they're hardworking. They're pet lovers. They're humans trying to get through COVID-19 without an ounce of direct tenant support from this government, a government that stripped away rent control and hasn't offered any direct rent relief or rent subsidies, emergency basic income, or a rent freeze to any tenants in Ontario, let alone 440, um, 440 Winona Drive, a government that will end eviction bans and in a matter of days, we'll send the tenants of 440 Winona Drive into homelessness. Speaker, 440 is managed by Marriott Group. During this pandemic, Marriott Property Management has intimidated my constituents with countless eviction notices, demanding the removal of their air conditioning, although they have submitted letters from their doctors, their mental health counselors. <sighs> demanding that their air conditioning are central, no pun intended, to their health. Today, I ask the Premier and this government what he will do to ensure our renters at 440 Winona Drive are taken care of, especially the most vulnerable and immunocompromised, and that they have access to air conditioning. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Member Statements, the member for Sarnia Lambton. Thank you, Speaker. I'm pleased to... Thank you. I'm pleased to rise today and speak about a number of terrific investments that this Ontario government has recently made in my riding, Sarnia Lambton. On July 14th, it was a privilege for me to announce that the Ontario government is investing $1.5 million in Sarnia Lambton's much called for oversized load corridor project. This investment was made by the Ministry of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade, and will bring, help bring this vital project one step closer to completion. As a community, we have been working on getting the funding for this project for nearly a decade. Once complete, the oversized load corridor will help to support our world-class fabrication shops and local industry partners by making it easier <coughs> to move large industrial components to and from the Sarnia Harbour. Additionally, last week, the Ministry of Transportation confirmed funding for two projects to repair and improve safety on the Highway 402. Construction will begin next month on the installation of Bluetooth readers, static border weight time signs, and other safety measures near the U.S. border. The second project consists of the rehabilitation of the airport road structure, including interchange improvements, ramp paving, and electrical upgrades. Finally, Mr. Speaker, our government recently invested $1.89 million in critical infrastructure funding for Blue Water Health, plus $4.5 million in increased budget funding for the Blue Water Health Hospital this year. Mr. Speaker, these are all terrific investments by the province and good news for everyone across our community. Thank you. Member statements. The member for Timmins. Mr. Speaker, I stand in the House today because of something that's going on not just in my constituency but across this province. As you know, there is in place a drug plan that is supposed to pay for medication for people who are younger, younger people under the age of 25. That is there to ensure that those people get what they need when they need it so that they can stay healthy and survive. This government, back in April of 2019, decided no. If you need a medication and you have a private plan, you must go to your private plan in order to have that paid. But here's the kicker. If the private plan doesn't pay it, the government doesn't want to pay it either. So people are having to pay for medication that otherwise should be covered by the plan that is currently in place in the province of Ontario. I have a constituent. They had a little baby, six months old now, who was on a feeding supplement that cost $80 for two days. They go to their private insurer, the private insurer says, no, we're not going to pay. So when they come to the province, the province says, no, we're not going to pay because you have a private insurance. The government's got to stop this. This is about people's health, and this is about them being able to get what they need when they need it. I call on this government to reverse their decision that they made in April of 2019 and to allow medication for people under the age of 25, such as nutritional supplements, to be paid for as they were before, because otherwise it's a grave injustice and you're putting people in a position they should never be in.
Thank you. Member Statements. The member for Brantford Brant. Thank you, Speaker. I stand today to recognize the dedication and service of two Brant County OPP constables. Yesterday marked the 50th anniversary of a horrific collision involving two constables of the Brant County OPP. Early in the morning on July 19, 1970, Constable Ron Hartman and Constable Stefan Schultz stopped the vehicle with five occupants. When a vehicle struck the two officers as well as the vehicle they had stopped, Constable Schultz was tragically killed, as were four occupants of the stopped vehicle. Constable Hardman was thrown nearly 100 feet and was left with severe injuries. With one leg amputated and the other one reconstructed, he was able to return home after nearly seven months. Despite the collision and his injuries, Constable Hardman returned to work with the OPP on May 4, 1971. Hardman clearly demonstrated his commitment to serving the community by continuing to work another 25 years following this terrible incident. Hardman and his wife still reside in the city of Brantford. As we recognize 50 years since this collision, I would like to honour Constable Schultz and Constable Hardman for their commitment to our community. I wish to offer my condolences to the family of Constable Schultz, who lost his life in the line of duty. I would also like to thank retired Constable Hardman for his years of public service, even after his life changed so much. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Member Statements, the member for Niagara Falls. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to call out corporate greed in my riding. Niagara Falls is the world's greatest destination to visit. Every year, our tourist industry brings millions into Niagara, and none of these visitors leave disappointed. We have a reputation for going above and beyond and delivering the vacation of a lifetime. The reason we have that reputation is because of the frontline staff. They're the first and last one visitors meet, and because of their hard work, visitors return. Right now, in the midst of this pandemic, it is those frontline workers who risk their health every single day so they can keep these attractions open and ensure our guests remain safe. Yet, and yet at Ripley's, believe it or not, on Clifton Hill, frontline front staff were told that their wages were being slashed when they returned. You know who owns this site? His name is Jim Pattison. He's Canada's third richest man, and he's worth seven billion dollars. That's with a B. Wow. Yet this billionaire is ripping wages away from our frontline workers. I am asking the Premier to stand with me and the people of Niagara Falls to tell Jim Pattison that this greed is unacceptable, to apologize to these workers and give them the wages that they have before the pandemic. Jim Pattison, you have brave workers working right now and have made you a fortune. Treat them with respect and also Let's get the $4 pandemic pay into the hands of our essential workers. Thank you very much. Member Statements. The member for Guelph. Thank you, Speaker. I recently met, met with Amy Greer, a constituent who is a Canada Research Chair in Population Disease Modeling at the University of Guelph. Amy wrote an op-ed with two other renowned epidemiologists in the Globe and Mail, and her message is clear. Students who are healthy and able should be given the opportunity for in-class learning five days a week in September. This can be done through the innovative use of community spaces, outdoor education, and new types of classrooms. But this planning should not be on the backs of school boards alone. The Premier has said he wants students back in schools five days a week, but he's prioritizing opening bars over schools. Speaker. School is five weeks away. We have heard no clear plan for how the province can open up for five days of in-class learning for our students. School boards have not received the funding they need to open safely. Speaker, we must prioritize our students because the return on investment in our children is priceless. Thank you. Member statements. The member for Willowdale. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Last week, I had the chance to visit the North York Central Library, one of my favorite spots in Willowdale, and chat with the incredibly knowledgeable and friendly staff about the measures they've taken to keep our community safe, as well as how they're preparing to enter stage three of our province's reopening. North York Central, Mr. Speaker, is no ordinary library. 
It's one of two reference libraries in Toronto, and it's home to amazing things like a 3D printing lab, a green screen movie studio, studio and a state-of-the-art sewing centre, and wonderful programming like afternoon tea and movies for seniors. Not to mention the massive collection of books in dozens of languages to serve my very diverse community. But, like all of us, our library has to adapt to the new normal, Mr. Speaker, and the city, so the seating areas are closed, books are quarantined for 72 hours before being returned to the shelves, and the 3D printers have been loaned to the University Health Network, where they run around the clock making face masks for our favourite heroes. And while Willowdalers still can't use many of the amenities the library usually offers, they can still borrow books and movies by appointment, uh, use the library computers to access the internet, and count on masked staff to help them for advice. Libraries are an essential part of our communities, and they're much more about books, Mr. Speaker. They're often the first stop for new Canadians settling in our neighbourhood, cooling centres on hot summer days, free workspace for entrepreneurs starting up a new business, or simply a safe place to sit. This morning, I want to thank the Toronto Public uh, the Library and all of the incredible staff at North York Central for all that they do and for their tireless efforts during this challenging time. I can't wait to go back, Mr. Speaker, and visit the North York Central, and you should all join me in Willow Dale. Member for Hamilton West, Ancaster Dundas. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Regan Russell was a friend to so many, and I'm honoured to say she was a friend of mine. Regan was run over and killed by a transport truck outside of Fearman Slaughterhouse on June 19th. She was there with others to bear witness. I last saw her in my office with another friend, Julie. They were opposed to Bill 156, very concerned that it would suppress free speech and make common acts of protest a crime. Of free speech, Regan said, how do you think women got the right to vote? How do you think slavery was abolished? People stood up. No one could imagine such a violent death for a woman, a woman who spent her life confronting injustice. Her husband, Mark Powell, said she was a constant voice for the voiceless. Mark, along with his son Joshua and her parents Bill and Pat, still have one another. Her mother said she doesn't belong to us anymore, she belongs to all these people here. And that is so true. Her death has sparked outrage around the world. The Parliament of Portugal held a moment of silence. Joaquim Phoenix said, and I quote, we will honour her memory by vigorously confronting the cruelties she fought so hard to prevent, by marching with black lives, protecting Indigenous rights, fighting for LGBTQ equality, and living a compassionate vegan life. I'll end with the beautiful words of Anne Bokma. Regan took the world into her arms. She embraced her partner, her parents, and her many friends, human and animal alike. She held us all close, and now we are faced with the sad task of letting her go. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The member for Oakville. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, today I have the honour to acknowledge local companies that have been working hard to keep our community of Oakville safe during this pandemic. My riding of Oakville is a hub for the nuclear energy sector. Oakville is home to companies such as Promation Canada, Laker Energy, Terrestrial Energy, among others. Last Thursday, the Honourable Member for Huron Bruce and I joined an event hosted by Promation and Bruce Power with Promation President Daryl Spector, Bruce Power CEO Mike Renchek, Bruce Power Executive Vice President James Skognak. These two companies have partnered together to undertake Bruce Power's MSR project. This project will support 22,000 jobs, inject $4 billion into our economy, and most importantly, provide Ontario with reliable, low-cost, clean energy. Not only are these companies involved in providing us with power, but they also answered the call to produce and donate PPE during the COVID-19. Promation has retooled their operations to produce ventilators, and Bruce Power has been a leading with PPE donations. Moreover, several of Promation's employees have gone above and beyond on their own time to produce face shield frames using 3D printers, and this has translated into Promation producing 650 frames a day. Finally, I want to highlight one more company, Acon. Their ongoing effort throughout the pandemic providing donations for the community has been admirable. I want to express my sincerest thank you to each of these companies. This is a testament to those helping those in need. Each company is a made in Ontario story and demonstrates genuine Ontario spirit. Thank you very much. Thank you. Member statements? The member for Mississauga Lakeshore. Thank you, Speaker. I rise here today to pay tribute to a great Ontarian, 
a visionary, businessman, larger-than-life community leader, and one of the greatest philanthropists in the history of Peel Regional. Ignat Kenev came to Canada as a young immigrant from Bulgaria in 1951. He had no friends, no family, and spoke no English. He had very little education and no money. He spent his, his only $5 to take a taxi from Union Station to Mississauga, where he lived in a garage, learned a trade, and went to work in construction, building the neighbourhood of Applewood Acres in Mississauga Lakeshore. Over the next seven decades, Iggy came to exemplify the very best in Canadian values — hard work, dedication, and community service. He built a real estate empire became a successful GM dealer along the way, and gave back tens of millions of dollars to schools, hospitals, and charities, starting with a $2,000 gift to build the Mississauga Hospital in 1955, the largest gift by an individual at the time, only four years after arriving in Canada. Iggy gave generously to the University of Toronto and Mississauga and to many groups that helped children with intellectual disabilities, including Community Living Mississauga. For this, Iggy was appointed to the Order of Ontario and the Order of Canada, recognized as the Mississauga Citizen of the Year and with the Bulgarian highest civil honours. His legacy will live on and has a positive impact on many lives for many years to come. So, that, so thank you, Iggy, for everything you have achieved and, most of all, for showing us that there is no limit to what you want to achieve in Ontario. Farewell, my friend. May you rest in peace. Thank you very much. That concludes our member statements for this morning.